Hello mudlarking friends and welcome to the second episode of two special videos coming to you from the great British county of Suffolk. In this episode we're on the rivers Deben and Stour and the North Sea checking out forts and fossils. First up the forts or in this case sea defences of both the Napoleonic and Second World Wars. We're in Bordsey, a coastal village bounded on the west by the River Deben and on the east by the North Sea, which today, with the tide almost fully in, illustrates exactly how this area is at the mercy of heavy erosion and why coastal protection is a constant concern. In recent years, the Environment Agency has spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on defensive rocks which should help protect against gale force winds and sea which so dominates this coastline. Described by the agency's Charles Beardsall as one of the most challenging parts of the East Anglian coast. Well, historically, that's not the least of their worries. Over the centuries, this coastline around Bordsey has experienced sustained risk of invasion when defence works became a necessity as early on as the 16th century. During the early 1800s, fears of invasion by Napoleon's army led to the building of seven Martello towers in this area alone. Those seven towers made up part of the 29 Martello Towers, originally built between 1808 and 1812 along the east coast of England, between St. Oseth in Essex and Aldborough in Suffolk. During the First World War, several concrete pillboxes were built in the same area. The advent of the Second World War saw further defences constructed, including the Bordsey Battery, which we'll take a look at now. Once it became likely, during May of 1940, that a full-scale invasion of the UK was a distinct possibility, further fortifications of the coastline became urgent and work began on an unprecedented scale. Britain's Emergency Coastal Defence Battery programme had begun. Despite it being determined at first that Bordsey would be unable to house such a battery due to the low-flying coastline, meaning the likelihood of any structure being flooded was certain, the area between Aldborough to the north and Felixstowe to the south was left so unguarded that works began nonetheless. In February 1942, 332 Battery Royal Artillery, who had manned Falness Battery in Essex since 1940, transferred, together with their guns, to the newly constructed works at Bordsey East Lane. By the time construction was complete, the battery would have been manned by approximately 80 men. The primary role of these batteries was to engage hostile vessels and to destroy the contents of beached craft two separate gun emplacements with a partially buried central shelter and two magazines per gun were housed here. The whole structure was defensible with gun loops. On each side of the guns, there were two coastal artillery searchlights in concrete emplacements with an effective range of 3,200 meters. Nissen huts were provided for office and domestic accommodation and the whole site was surrounded by barbed wire. Each battery was responsible for its own defence and gunners would have been allocated to defend the perimeter. The pillboxes, which had been built in 1940, long before the construction of the battery, may have been used as part of their defensive plan. From the summer of 1942, the possibility of invasion sharply diminished and so a series of cuts were planned to release men for other tasks. In December 1943, Bordsey was put under care and maintenance, leaving one officer and seven regular gunners with the balance made by the Home Guard. The final closure of the battery took place in the spring of 1945. Today, heavy erosion by the sea has taken its toll, although new beach defences are much in evidence. Over the last 10 years, the two searchlight emplacements and the pillboxes, with the exception of one from the First World War, have been lost to the sea. Inland, in the distance, with its armoured steel roof, is the square battery observation post, said to be one of the best preserved examples of this kind, and since 2005, 
features a number of appropriate interventions, an art project entitled Prisoner of War, made by the artist Bettina Fernie in collaboration with writers Tony Mitten and Simon Fraser. Recalling memories of older generations from Bordsey, a series of texts have been applied to the observation post, some stenciled, some cut from sheets of iron, some spelled out with beads along the window bars. I'd like to read parts of some of those texts to you now. I went to get the cows off the marshes. There were horses and cows and sheep all floating about through the buildings down there. Just water everywhere. They were all flooded and they never went back to marshes no more. One yank in a boat, he saved all sorts of people, didn't he? That was a bad time. I ain't likely to forget it. The plane came down and the pilot was a New Zealander. Bullets were flying all out of the plane. A German bomber crashed on the marshes and there was a terrible smell of burnt bodies for a long while after that. They buried them up at the churchyard, in the far corner. In the winter of 47, you couldn't get out of here at all. Gang loads of German prisoners helped to clear the roads. When the snow cleared, you had ice coming down the rivers. That summer was a beautiful summer. The sea was absolutely flat calm, clear like the Mediterranean. We all learned to swim that summer. Visible in the distance, just a few minutes walk from the World War II battery, is Martello Tower W, built in the early 1800s. During the early 1800s, fear of invasion by Napoleon's army led to the building of 18 Martello Towers on the Suffolk coast. And in this small area alone, there were once seven towers. Tower W is one of the remaining towers that hasn't been washed into the sea, pulled down due to development or turned into a residential property. Now, interesting fact for you fact fans, Martello Y at East Lane Bordsey won an RIBA award for its conversion to a private house. How about living here then? Built between 1805 and 1812, the squat round structure of the brick built Martello Towers made them immensely strong. They were even resistant to cannon fire. Inspired by an ancient watchtower at Mortella Point in Corsica, the towers measure up to 40 feet tall and typically garrisoned one officer and 15 to 25 men over two floors. Mounted on the flat roof of the tower would be a single piece of movable heavy artillery, which could be rotated a complete 360 degrees, protecting the tower from all threats. The design was clearly a solid defensive classic, and although Martello towers were only used during the first half of the 19th century, becoming obsolete with the introduction of powerful rifled artillery, Lord Palmerston, in the second half of the 19th century, oversaw another spate of tower and fort building, which were also circular in design and much resembled Martello towers. Let's leave the drama and bluster of the North Sea now and take a trip across to the River Deben, specifically to Ramsalt. It's a fossil hunting hotspot. And although time, light and weather was against us, we couldn't pass through the area without checking the foreshore at a particular spot said to be rich in fossils. Incidentally, Bordsey is also a fossil hunting haven. You can even find megalodon teeth there. But as you could see, the tide was high and the fossil spot inaccessible. So let's move on to our next location now. Right, here we go. We're down at the bay by the lovely Ramsholt Arms and it's time for me to break it to my travelling companion, my mother, that we're about to attack a 40 minute coastal path walk in the bluster and gale. Our destination, that spot up there, up the coast, round the bend and then a bit more, that's where we're going. The tide is about to turn, so we'll be hunting on an outgoing tide and in theory we'll have lots of searching time, but as you can see the light is fading, the tide is only just about to turn. Let's see what we can do though. Now here we go again, that thing I love about estuary locations. Inland waterways, marshland, mudflats, woods, fields, we've got it all going on here. And how about that then? Dream house material or what? I would absolutely love to live in that exact location, in that exact house right there. 
Okay, time for another change of scenery. Here we go through a wooded area. Look at all this lush, pillowy fern. It's just gorgeous. And we're out again, onto the other side of the wood. Not our destination yet, but let's hop down and have a little look at the foreshore here. All right, Mother, just a little further up, I promise. Not that I've actually been here before, but uh, I think it's about a 40 minute walk, so I'll know where we are when I spot a particular tree, and that's a true story. Okay, here we are, our fossil hunting spot. So let's take a little look at what we've got here. Ramsholt is said to be one of the best, most productive fossil hunting locations in Suffolk. The foreshore and cliff is stuffed full with remnants of the past, in the form of shark's teeth, lobster, crab, echinoids, bivalves, fish remains, even ancient plants and nuts and seeds. Now the land and cliff is made up of red crag, coralline and London clay. And when the tide is going down, it shouldn't be too hard to find yourself some goodies. At this point, I must confess that I'm not much of a fossil hunter. Unless it jumps out at me and it's patently obvious what I'm looking at, I do get a bit stuck. So really, I'll be happy with anything I managed to identify today. And everything here looks like it could be something. A lot of it polished and fossily looking. So we'll take the rough with the smooth as it were. I just wanted to show you a bit of the foreshore. So there's some cliff in there, which I think is red crag. Um, and there is coralline. And then we've got London clay as well. So I'm just gonna have a good old look and see what I can find. Wish me luck. It's the bivalves that are doing it for me. Here. Oh, it's bigger than I thought. Let's give that a rush. Now that is very pretty. So far, that's my find of the day. For some reason, I've found a piece of what appears to be redware with a glaze. Um, there we go. Nice old redware from London, probably. So yeah, I'm just gonna keep on looking here. I found some little bivalve fossil fragments, but nothing amazing yet. What I'd really love to find is a shark's tooth. So fingers crossed, I find them on the Thames. I'd love to find one here. Okay, let's get stuck in again. And here it comes, the fresh flash of an instant coastal downpour. But I've got a good feeling that it won't be long until it passes. Well, that's what I told my mother at least. For now, we're gonna take a bit of shelter under this tree. Okay, so I haven't yet found the shark tooth that I'm so keen to find, but in all honesty, I've found far more identifiable fossils on the Thames. 
just check these out so you can compare the kind of things that leap out at you on the Thames compared to this area here and how tough going it is. And so this whole host of beauties here are all Thames found from shark's teeth to echinoids, ammonites, you can see this one is partially piratized, bellum knights and many fossil imprints. These here, these little sucker looking urchins are my favorites. Now, let's check out what I found at Ramsholt. Best finds are definitely small pieces of ray tooth. And this perfect bivalve fossil, gorgeous. And there are lots of other little bits and pieces here, but I'm not really too sure about them. So it was reassuring that speaking to my mudlarking pal, Sam, who is known online as Megasteg, she is a keen and knowledgeable fossil hunter and she reassured me a little. So she explained that fossil hunting at Ramsholt can be tricky as some of the fossils are London clay fossils and they have been fossilized twice. So that's a bit unusual. You can indeed find crabs, fish vertebra seeds, denticles, shark and ray teeth, but you still need to get your eye in. And Sam's also noticed actually that finding shark teeth here has become less common recently. She also goes on to say that it's tricky spotting such small fossils and there are lots of imposters. So I think I'm probably gonna have to do more than one visit here to find that elusive shark's tooth. And she did make me feel a little bit better about my lack of excellent finds, but I'm pleased with the few items I did bring home. Well, that's all for us on the Suffolk trip for now. But being a recent convert to the county, I'm sure it won't be long before I'm back again to have some more adventures in this beautiful place with its fascinating inland and coastal landscapes. If you haven't already, please check out the first part of my Suffolk series where I take you boat building and boat wrecking. Until next time, mudlarking friends, take care and be merry. And if you'd like even more mudlarking and exploring content to wrap your ears and eyes around, please do check out my Patreon site. Links in the video description.